the reason that most people shouldn't be friends with uh, people of any kind of like extreme awfulness is because most people aren't good at being friends, to be honest. Being a good friend with people involves not just kind of saying nice things to them or talking to them in a polite way or whatever. It also involves like taking them seriously in the sense that you like actively challenge them. Serbian podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and my in the internet ether studio guest today, someone whose actual name you're not gonna know, but we're going to call him Charles G. Coke. Welcome, Charles. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna read this very real, very non lawsuit worthy bio for Charles, which says Wikipedia will tell you that Charles G. Koch is an 87 year old businessman with an estimated net worth of $62 billion, most known as a financial backer for several libertarian think tanks and the secret source of all your problems, unless it's Soros, you know, or both. He tweets at, uh, at worst underscore account. Charles G. Koch has never denied this description, but also represents himself through a painting of a Wolverine in a suit and posts, from an individualist anarchist perspective, and they're good posts. Sometimes these posts seem to imply that he's a graduate student in philosophy, but uh, you decide. Huh. That was a good, very helpful bio. Um, well, do you want? Do you know anything else you want to tell us um, about yourself beyond what we just read, or is that going to be enough for the people? Um, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> I guess we're going to talk about some of the debates you've been having because, I mean, the eternal question of platforming versus not. And I always feel like it's very in vogue to ignore all terrible people amongst radicals. And I certainly find that unsatisfying. But um, tell me about your politics, if you would. Yeah. I don't know if you've had a journey. Actually, you know what? These are things I feel like I should know about you, but I don't necessarily. Yeah, know. yeah. I... I... So one thing that kind of frustrated me in the the Dave Smith conversation is I described my I had a joke that I think no one in the audience of like hundreds of people in that chat seemed to get and this was frustrating to me because I thought at least they would get this joke uh, which is I described myself as a left libertarian radical individualist anarchist in the tradition of and I said like Murray Rothbard, Lysander Spooner, uh, a few other names, Carl S., a few other names, and then I said Dana Rohrabacher. Um, I thought that was pretty funny, but I, I think none of them got that joke. I don't think I do funny. either. So Oh, okay. Dana Rohrabacher is now a Republican congressman. Uh, right, the from, name. Yeah, yeah. But he, in college, was more or less seemed to be like an agorist type like oh, anarchist libertarian he's even quoted in the first edition of uh machinery of freedom uh you can if you like go back to like really old libertarian like radical libertarian like periodicals like and like anarchist libertarian periodicals you can like find references to dana rohrabacher and his like student organizations and stuff uh, well, this is just very funny to me, and I that thought just made him more interesting than he's ever been. Even though, yeah, that's I thought sad. that everyone knew this <laughs> in like who is like into like deep cut like radical libertarian world stuff, uh, but yeah, that was anyway. No one seemed to get that joke, uh, <laughs> and so I was frustrated. But yeah, I mean, just uh, broadly of the more. Uh, libertarian identifying part of C4SS, I guess, would be the way I would categorize my politics. Um, to some extent, that's not, that's less, that hinges less on on theory and more on personal background, I guess, but to some extent, but yeah, I guess just broadly individualist anarchist is what I would say if I was just strict sticking to cutting away any kind of like tribal identifiers as much as they can uh, in just flat statement, I guess. 
did you, like Dana, have any kind of journey to this, by the way? Have you ever been anything else? Yeah, I mean, I started out much more conservative, I guess. And then in high school, uh, someone said that they thought that I was more of a libertarian, uh, which I don't actually think was true at the time. But that made me curious about that idea. And uh, when I was in high school, I started reading some like Ayn Rand stuff, and that kind of killed off the social conservatism for me. And then also uh, the first Ron Paul campaign was happening, and that killed off the uh, foreign policy problems uh, with conservatism for me. Uh, and then I was pretty bog standard libertarian for a while, never an anarchist. And then uh, through conversations with a friend of mine who was democratic socialist, we kind of both stumbled on to C4SS stuff and both uh, kind of converged in that territory. And up after that point, uh, I became an anarchist and uh, the reason there being a lot of the problems that I had with with anarcho-capitalism, I guess, uh, went out the window with the more left libertarian perspective, things about like that skyrocketing into like wealth concentration where it ends up being a new government or something like that. Uh, that seems to go out the window when you have more like left libertarian assumptions about how that kind of economy would work, I guess. That's the short version, I guess. Uh, some might call you, however, a, a strain of radical liberal, um, an advocate for liberalism within anarchism, I would say, more than um, a lot of anarchists are. Yeah, I guess I would describe myself as a an anarchist, a libertarian, and a liberal, uh, all three of those things, and those three things... Uh, are sometimes taken to be in conflict, but I don't think that they are. Um, it, and in fact, that the most consistent version of each of those things entails the others. Uh, and I guess by liberalism, I would just mean something like a view of politics that is centered on fundamentally seeing cooperation as a good thing, seeing the importance of uh, individuals relating to each other as equals in some fundamental way and i guess also rule of law in the very particular sense that no one no one has power as much as uh, they are subject to norms everyone is subject to the same kind of norms uh, but if you take those ideas uh, to their consistent endpoints i think that you end up in a form of anarchism uh, and that's what i would have in mind now, obviously, there's other ways to use the term liberal. So uh, some people might instead see something unique about liberalism as formalizing those things into uh, a kind of uh, state system. So someone like uh, Gillis, uh, I think, sees that as more central. And I would just say that Gillis is talking about something fundamentally different than I am. That's fine. People can use words however they want to use them. But when I say that I am a liberal, that's more or less what I mean. Not, not the, not that, but the good stuff that I was just saying. Yeah. I almost want to go down a tangent about rule of law because have you ever written anything specifically about that phrase? Because that's not a very radical phrase. Most yeah. Of so, so here's what I, here's what I would say about that is remember what the rule of man, law is supposed to be contrasted to, which is the rule of men. Mm -hmm it's power held by particular people. And the idea is that, that people are, are subject to rules, but they're not subject to rulers. Mm -hmm. And of course, rules without rulers is a standard way of talking about, about anarchism. Uh, and I just see law as kind of the fundamental norms for settling disputes involving force. Uh, that's more or less what I would have in mind there. Obviously, it has no reason that it has to be monopolized, no reason that it has to be centralized. And that's what I have in mind. And uh, I would recommend, so 
And I think even the more libertarian averse crowd would still be interested in this. I would recommend uh, an essay by uh, John Hasnas, H-A-S-N-A-S, who is a libertarian anarchist law professor. uh, And the title of the essay is The Myth of the Rule of Law. And effectively, he argues that the rule of law is not uh, an idea that can actually be made sense of within the context of the state and can only made, be made sense of in an anarchist context. Uh, so that's what I would recommend on that. I'm suddenly curious, like, what your beliefs, when you, if you ever clash with um, social anarchists with some of your interpretations of anarchism. Have you, do you have any personal experience with that, or is that just the usual? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely true. Um, for obvious reasons. Um, So I think they're more productive and less productive clashes. Uh, So a kind of unproductive clash is just conversation about definitions that is very uh, semantic in the least interesting sense. Mm. And I, I, I used to care about those things a lot more than I do now. And now I'm usually more prone to say, this is what I mean by the term. I understand if you mean it differently, but um, I think also beyond that, they're more substantive conversations. Uh, I think that the kind of anarchism that I am interested in is not when I say that I'm interested, that I, that I see my views as falling within anarchism, libertarianism and liberalism. I don't just mean the, those things in like the trivial way in which you might call a particular person, all three of those things. When I am uh, influenced by uh, liberalism, I'm influenced by the broad liberal tradition. When I'm influenced by libertarianism, I'm influenced by the broad libertarian tradition that includes liberals who are not libertarians or anarchists that includes libertarians who are not liberals or anarchists. And also that when I say I'm influenced by anarchism, I am influenced even including by uh, the kind of more social anarchist world. And I am actually persuaded of the thought that uh, anarchism actually requires or maybe uh, strongly suggests. I'm not sure exactly how to, how to cash this out, but I at least think there are good reasons if you're an anarchist to be interested in challenging, over, overturning, etc., uh, all systems of power, not just those that are the, the formal state. Um, I think a lot of the problems in most libertarian anarchism do do end up falling in that territory. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess I would say I am skeptical that social anarchism is either, by what I take to be social anarchism in terms of abolishing the market, money, uh, private property, etc. I don't think that that is either uh, certainly not necessary for uh, challenging all systems of power. And I would go further than that and to say that there are certain kinds of informal uh, systems of power that could even be entrenched by eliminating the market as sure. something that tends to uh, destabilize uh, longstanding systems of power especially traditional authorities. Families, I mean. (laughs) Yeah. Just, I mean, think of all the reasons that the average integralist, uh, ultra right-wing person is increasingly turning against uh, fusionism, and those would be similar reasons to what I have in mind. Turning against it as in no longer pretending to... He would yes, be a Reagan-esque exactly. libertarian. Yeah. yeah. Getting the worst of both um, yeah. of late. If, any, if you or anyone else hears any revving, it's my neighbors who proudly wave a blue, thin blue line flag every single day. So it's not my right. fault. <laughs> my thing was always like the state is sort of so obviously the worst one that the more I go on, the more I realize that, you know, the... Hans Hermann Hoppe types 
they honestly want authoritarianism. They just want it on a small scale and not small enough even, but even that is authoritarianism. Like that's, you know, they're not really against it. They're arguably against a state. I would also add that even just on the question of the formal state, uh, that not having a hostile orientation towards other forms of social power will even clamp down on your ability to consistently oppose this, the actual just formal state. Uh, so, for example, I don't think that you can fully understand the problems with uh, immigration law unless you also have in mind something like white supremacy as a system of power to challenge. I think there's a lot that you don't won't understand about economic regulation as exists as a system without understanding that the system as a whole tends to favor the already uh, economically powerful and that there is something objectionable about that. Those kinds of things, I think that you that it's going to hinder your analysis, even just of the thing that you are being reductive to. So, yeah. Oh, I guess I, I always come back to the vague question of, you know, what values do actually need to hold in order to be, I don't know, libertarian or you know, all the other terms you like to use. And I remember this sort of, I, I tend to turn to the basic, what I first heard from Sheldon Richmond thing, which was just that like, it's a crappy foundation for liberty. Not that it yeah. is or isn't this, but it's it's a it's a rotten floorboard, you know, that's gonna make yeah, it fall certainly. into <laughs> And you know, I we're obligated to like get mad if like Ruby Ridge happens to, you know, racists, but uh hmm. it's definitely our job to not be on their team, I suppose. Yeah. It is it is a difficult balance because you don't want to because on the one hand you I think that it's necessary to have those other systems of power in mind. But you don't want to forget the uh, state power as an, as its own system of power and just think, oh, well, maybe we could just take the state and use that to start crushing these external systems of power. Uh, I mean, that's just like the basic mistake of uh, Leninism, for example. Or almost any radical ism seems to drift towards that inevitably yeah. unfortunately or enthusiastically of course if you if you prefer that now i no longer really have a good segue but i was going to ask you about neoliberalism and how come you don't like it yeah so that's a difficult question because there's so many different ways people use that term both yeah i'm still kind of fuzzy in some ways yeah, both people who like it, people mm -hmm. who don't like it, um, etc. So here's what I would take it to mean, which I think is broadly in the ballpark, both of a lot of what the people who use it as a pejorative have it in mind and what a lot of the people who are self-identifying with it have in mind it might not be perfectly either of those things, but it's at least in the ballpark of both of them, which is something that has the technocratic, has the same kind of impulse as the early 20th century technocratic progressivism, except that unlike the technocratic progress, progressive, it doesn't, is incorporating a lot of more, I guess you might call it like market friendly economics and uh, other kinds of developments of social science of the last, uh, since then, I guess, um, last hundred years. And it ends up being critical of a lot of various kinds of regulations, things like uh, zoning, as we know it, uh, things like the sheer extent to which like cars are subsidized, um, things like limits on nuclear energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, things that are all well and good, but it's not coming at it from the perspective that it is better fundamentally for uh, people to self-organize, for people to, that the best things are not things that you can plan from above, but rather it's 
still kind of coming at it from the perspective of we have to do something to plan this from above. Sure. It's just that the way that we have to plan it from above is kind of designing the background institutions just right so that things will trend in a favored direction and we take a light-handed approach in kind of nudging things in a better direction. And I guess my my main criticism I get, I have a lot of criticisms of that. Some that are just kind of basic disagreements of first principles, but a couple ways I would put it is when you don't have a fundamentally hostile orientation towards the state, it's going to be a little bit more surprising when trying to get just the right kind of regulatory tweaks doesn't go the way you want it to when uh, you keep finding that it's that it goes in exactly the sorts of directions that you've written all these sorts of policy papers on about how this doesn't work because it's what drives uh, state politics is not what these utility calculuses say. It's instead what gets votes, what happens to favor the power, the already powerful, et cetera, et cetera. And that th- there really isn't an option of getting this very particular uh, jerry-rigged combination this of just the right kinds of regulations, just the right kinds of interventions, et cetera, et cetera, with regulators who know all of the papers you have in mind and are going to apply those things, et cetera, et cetera. The realities of politics are just going to tend in a very particular direction, and the only real option is to just cut it off from from the head and instead just try to eliminate power as much as you can, try to build alternatives from outside of it uh, where you can actually have some more control over what you're doing, uh, even if you don't have the kind of, uh, what's I'm looking for, the... Uh, promise of something that can kind of feel like a lever that you can pull on that will adjust society as a whole. You can actually know that you will be doing more or less what you want to be doing, et cetera, et cetera. So first, it's more realistic. Second, I guess, that without that fundamental hostility to power, you're more likely to find yourself taking steps that seem like not that big of a compromise, but end up going in pretty obviously atrocious directions down the line. I mean, I think, again, a lot of the things that span out of the early 20th century uh, progressivism are exactly the same sorts of things that the neoliberal crowd is now trying to push back on. But those came from the same technocratic impulses. And I mean, the worst form of this is, of course, at the level of foreign policy, Uh, I think a lot of people who rightly are very upset with kind of the paleo-libertarian direction uh, and really showing their face in the Trump era have forgotten that the the reason that things in the libertarian world drifted that way in the first place is because of the failure from a lot of uh, places on foreign policy and failing to see that you can't just kind of tweak the, the the rest of the world into liberal democracies with guns and bombs, et cetera, et cetera. And the fundamental neoliberal impulse seems to be one that would take you back in that direction. So yeah, that, that would be, those would be the broad strokes of my problems with the neoliberal crowd. You know, I hear kind of mainstream Democrats or maybe vaguely lefter than that critiquing neoliberalism so often, but, your description of it to me sounds so status quo if we just get the extra good wonk who knows even more and is nice then he will fix it i mean it almost sounds just like get the right guy who knows enough to make the magic happen when you put it that way yeah and it's it's a weird kind of that cuz it's not you just get our guy it's get the guy who knows all of this this particular... Or even get the right equation somehow. Yeah, exactly. Will... Yeah. You, sometimes when Democrats critique neoliberalism, to me, they're pointing out that they're the good things or the ghost of good things that it involves. So I always, I ask myself this constantly. 
I'm addicted to the word libertarian and I've yet to be able to give it up. And for as long as I've been one, its reputation has been pretty bad in many corners. And I would say it's getting significantly worse. So why are you still using that word to describe yourself or anything, um, any good goal that, that could be out there? Well, I guess I'll have, I'll have three quick answers on that. One, I share your perception, but an interesting thing that I keep noticing is, and this is usually the kind of heuristic that I would caution against, but I find that every now and then, so the more most like self-consciously right wing people in the vaguely libertarian sphere mm. also do not like the word libertarian much anymore. So That's for true. example, so first, uh, and, and nor do a lot of the people who are not even pretending to be libertarians who are right wing will actively make a point to define themselves against libertarianism. So for example, Reason just had a very critical review of Chris Ruffo's book and Chris Ruffo said something to the effect of they have it because the review said something about Ruffo turning into what he hates or something like that. And he says, what I hate is libertarianism. And thankfully I've never turned into that. And then, um, and then in the replies to that, someone else who is also in that kind of like right wing sphere was pushing back on him for saying that he hates libertarianism. And then of all people, interestingly enough, Jeff Deist, who is, of course, like the until pretty recently vice president of the Mises Institute, very actively part of bringing back uh, paleo libertarianism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, also said, "Look, what you don't understand is that libertarianism now means something else, and what it means is is something bad." What does it mean? I mean, to him, what does it mean? So I think from his perspective, he thinks that it means what we would like it to mean, <laughs> that it's much more like, I don't know, he woke or whatever he would say. Right, yeah. That it doesn't understand the complexities of immigration or whatever. I don't know. But that's, so that was interesting to me. And I, so I, I again, I would usually caution against the heuristic of well the people i disagree with don't like this so it must be right but i do think it at least means that it is not universally taken to mean the jeff diced type of libertarianism if jeff diced himself thinks that the term has fallen in directions that we might like more um so that's my first thought my second thought is and i'm very stubborn about this I'm probably unusually so, and sometimes I go back and forth about whether this is the right approach, but I'm very stubborn about, like, if a term refers to a set of ideas and is generally still understood to refer to a set of ideas, like if you ask someone what is libertarianism and they gave you a set of ideas, it would still probably be in the right ballpark, I think. I guess, yeah when they start spelling out what they think the implications of those ideas are, that might go astray. Right. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like what the ideas are, I think that they would still say things like uh, individual Liberty, free markets, small government. They'd probably say exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. And I guess it's, my thought is none of the problems that I can see with libertarianism the movement, the social phenomenon, libertarianism, have much of anything to do with the ideas and in fact are overwhelmingly at odds with the ideas. And I'm very stubborn about using words. Surely some words are ruined. No, that's true. Obviously symbols yeah, yeah, get yeah, ruined yeah. all the time. No, that's true. But and and I, I guess but I guess my thought here, and this is, I don't even know if this is an argument as much as it is just a personal confession that I tend to be much stronger and more uh, on uh, in terms of like stubbornness about using words to the ideas that are uh, like associated with them rather than kind of the social meta- metadata of mm-hmm. them, I guess. But so that that's my second reason. And then my third is I don't think there's really an alternative 
so I mean, I like call myself a radical liberal, but of course, like you're only going to understand what that means in any meaningful sense. If we have a conversation more than like two minutes about that, it's not like we are going to change the word liberal to just mean something broadly libertarian. Uh, that's like an insane that I, I see people say that every now and then. I, I honestly think that is a ridiculously optimistic view of a bunch of people on Twitter's ability to change the meanings of words in the American vocabulary. I mean, liberal now could be anything from mainstream Democrat to ardent Dave Rubin listener, you know, because he yeah. um, decided he was a classical liberal. I don't know if he's still. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even that, like, I, I, I was really worried about that, but even that seems to have been falling away now, <laughs> which is kind of strange, but like, as in, I mean, like, I, I barely ever hear people ta- using the Dave Rubin sense of that mm-hmm. anymore, which is which is a rare moment of grace that the world <laughs> has bestowed on us. But I, I just think people overestimate their ability to control language uh, sure. on that. And then second, like, I mean, suppose that you successfully did this. If you're talking to people about anything beyond, like, stuff that has been written in the last like five years once you have done this you're gonna have to be recommending people things that are using the word libertarian Mm -hmm. and i it seems like like it it doesn't seem like it's really like an option to just abandon the word if you're still going to be advocating the ideas and so i guess my recommendation to people is to first of all the focus on promoting your ideas more than any particular word. But then also when describing your ideas, it's a, a one good reason to identify them with libertarianism is that that's how the meaning of the word changes sure. is by what people take the people advocating with that word in mind to be saying. And if they have more and more examples of people using that word while they are advocating more, uh, substantively ideas that fit with liberty with libertarianism actually fit with care for other people etc like kind of the, its radical liberal spirit then that will be more and more what it, they associate it with so if you're the kind of person who is concerned about that maybe you have a special reason to uh, identify as libertarian i mean sometimes now you see for example, the Southern Poverty Law Center, who I used to dislike more, when they're describing ex-libertarian figures like Christopher Cantwell, who went full fascist, Augustus Invictus, who probably was always a fascist, the fact that those people were disliked by other libertarians forces them to differentiate between libertarian camps. So the terrible people using the word actually forces them (laughs) to describe and accidentally make the other libertarians look better. So, and I almost wonder if a little bit of that is happening with the Libertarian Party um, fights with the stupid Mises Caucus uh, takeover as well. Yeah, this is not what you're asking, but I just do want to observe an interesting thing, which I find fascinating is, so I have invested too much time watching that kind of stuff. And uh, so the LP New Hampshire crowd, mm-hmm. And the broader Mises Caucus crowd uh, for the last several months have actually really disliked each other. I don't know if you've noticed this. Um, And after the recent spat of New Hampshire tweets, I'm seeing more and more of those, the Mises Caucus crowd kind of trying to distance themselves from them. And I guess it's not surprising to me because my my running thought on the Mises Caucus was that people sometimes will say, oh, well, they're just trying to, they're secretly Trumpist and mm-hmm. they want to take it over and make it just like a wing of the Republican Party or, oh, they're secretly like alt-right or whatever, whatever, whatever. And I don't disagree that they're horrible, but I think that that almost gives them too much credit because it's not anything so ideological as that that seems to be motivating Mises caucus crowd as much as just petty 
dislike for mm-hmm. particular other parts of the libertarian movement. About six people I can name have, seems to have motivated 80%. Exactly. Of and the highest aspirations of their politics have always been to upset other libertarians. And even when they're saying things that are upsetting to other people generally, the thing that seems to get them the most going is knowing that people like us will be very upset seeing a a checkmarked account of a Libertarian Party affiliate saying these things. And if you have a political movement that is so based on just upsetting people and just pure conflict, it is unsurprising when that movement itself starts to splinter into hostility once it has kind of won in a certain respect, which is I, I actually winning control of the Libertarian Party, then they have no really else to go. And so now they're just fighting each other. And that should be totally unsurprising, I think. I thought what else was now victory was next because fusionism with the far right clearly has never been tried before. And it, it'll work this time as long as we're extra trolly on the Internet. I mean, I don't know what the, you know, the greater scheme beyond that even is. Um, but you might, because you have talked to some of these bozos. I mean, do you want to tell the good people who you've debated with in these um, uh, reactionary libertarian camps and why, among other things? Yeah. So um, I guess the two that I've put my, so like, I mean, I spent a lot of time just like arguing with people on Twitter, which might not be healthy, but also I did a couple things like voice conversation. One with the bishop, who is very far right, mm. explicitly paleo libertarian. I don't, I don't know actually how he would identify himself these days, but at least certainly some kind of paleo something. Is he directly Mises? Caucus, uh, Mises Institute related. Yeah, yeah, he's affiliated with with Mises Institute, and his. Uh, I'll, I'll say more, and then I had another thing uh, with Dave Smith more recently, and though his broad position is more or less something like the Rothbard Rockwell position of the '90s, which is that for various reasons that the best thing for libertarians to do is to help boost a right-wing populist movement within the Republican Party that would then be decentralizing and uh, non-interventionist, et cetera, et cetera. And all the reasons that should obviously sound not good to listeners Mm -hmm. are also things that I agree with listeners on. And I I think that there's a lot of people who are not deep down uh, reactionaries, at least not at this time, who can get sucked into that kind of thing because, among other things, getting the feeling of participating in a political moment that is actually having some success in terms of winning candidates and elections and so on and so forth, getting talked about on a daily basis in national media, it feels like you are really a part of something. And especially if it's something that so many people are mad about, uh, and then this is the kind of heuristic I was saying that I usually caution against, that if so many people are mad about it, especially if it's the people you think are bad, you think, well, man, maybe this is really the threat or something like that. And I think that there are people who are uh, thinking too quickly is the maybe the most charitable way to put it, who are not already far down that reactionary rabbit hole and still are committed to basic libertarian principles who can get sucked into that kind of thing. And the reason that I think that it's worth having those conversations is because of those people. I don't think that I'm going to persuade Tho Bishop in a conversation with him, except on maybe like one or two, two points, Um, at least not in a individual conversation like that. Uh, I don't think I'm going to persuade him and that's nothing special about him. It's just, I don't think he would persuade individual people that quickly, but I do think that people, when they criticize the utility of conversations, 
sometimes are thinking too much in terms of persuading the other person or the, the hardened supporter of that person, where the right way to look at it is kind of like the marginal potential mm-hmm. Tho Bishop rather than like Tho Bishop or the, the hardened Tho Bishop supporter. It's who is the marginal person who, who might go that way or might not. And I think it's if you don't have anyone who is even talking to those people, then people who have nonetheless found themselves on that side of the wall, more or less, of the of the non-interaction, it's not as if they like see an alternative. And I think it's good to at least like put a hole in the wall in that respect in terms of someone seeing an alternative to that. And that's that's more or less what I the utility I see in that kind of conversation. I do even think with like the hardened supporters that like conversation is helpful, but in a very different way that is not amenable to what like individual instances like that. I guess I will just say like briefly what I have in mind there, because this is might be relevant. So like something that was like very influential on me personally is that when I was in college as with tr- is true of a lot of people who are interested in uh, radical ideas, I have a fascination with extreme ideas of all kinds, good mm-hmm. and bad. Mm-hmm. Me too. Like I am interested in reading about cults and things like that. And I am interested in hearing from people on like why they believe what they believe, et cetera, et cetera. And I, in college, ended up stumbling into being friends with some very extreme conservative Calvinist uh, Christians who were, who were generally very intelligent Mm -hmm. and arguing with them about all sorts of political, social, uh, religious things. And then out of that group formed a particularly extreme anti-abortion group, not one that is threatening like extra legal violence or anything like that, but, in terms of like their actual positions, like a very mm-hmm. extreme uh, things like they thought that it was, uh, do you remember the thing where like Trump uh, in 2016, when Trump in 2016, like accidentally uh, took that more consistent position of saying you actually put the woman in the woman in prison and not just the abortion doctor. I know people have, I, th- I think, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So Trump accidentally, took that position uh, and it was a whole controversy. And then I think he scaled it back or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in that moment uh, they were like, no, this is actually like the right position. And also they have evolved slowly into like antagonizing other pro-life people for uh, taking any position that is less than that. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's so particularly extreme is what I'm trying to get here. And even upon like them starting that group, I still was in social contact with those people. I argued with them frequently. I saw them in other contexts that were not arguing with them. And over time, uh, so now they're still, that's still a group that is still has like major, like I still see them having influence on politics of my home state, for example. But the people that I actually knew and there would be like, I'd say about, seven or eight and who were part of the founding group of that uh, organization slowly i noticed like more one by one they kind of like dropped out of that group and overwhelmingly i would see them describe it as a cult now and typically have very polar opposite positions on a lot of things from that group and i don't see the people who i didn't who I wasn't, my, my friend group wasn't friends with. I don't see them uh, dropping out of that group. And I think that there's something about having social contacts who are not a part of your ideology that makes it like psychologically possible for you to break from the ideology, right? Yeah. To begin with. And so, I, but of course, that requires a lot more than like a one on one conversation. But nonetheless, I think that, that that has like kind of made it hard for me to take the kind of like knee jerk version of no platform that a lot of people have endorsed to to a point that I think becomes less no platform and just no interaction at all. Because mm-hmm. I mean, so on the Tho Bishop thing, 
that I was not platforming though Bishop though Bishop had a much larger platform than me and it was not like he was coming on my podcast or something he it was uh, this other YouTube channel uh, that was that was certainly not left libertarian and then the Dave Smith thing was so Dave Smith I'm sure a lot of people listening to this know who he is but Alleged comedian. Yeah, so comedian, podcaster, uh, who is anarcho-capitalist, but of like a very hoppy and variety. For a while, like kind of saw himself as the linen of the Mises Caucus, etc., etc., etc. And he noticed notably. Okay, there's there's distinctions to make between the, his sort of thing and the like out and out paleo libertarians, but that would be too long of a tangent. But also, I find that at least a, a large chunk of his fans are worse than he is. A large chunk of his fans are worse than he is, and a large chunk of his fans are better than he is, which is fascinating. Like, but he plays like the re- the the reasonable, even handed paleo sometimes. Like he'll get trolly, but he's not doing the over the top. I don't know. Yeah, so so something I think is is interesting is like a lot of his fans will like actually like be pro open borders, mm-hmm. but they just don't think it's as important right. of a, of a question, and that kind of gets back to what I was saying about not having broader hostility to power, like softening softening your opposition even just to the formal state. And two, I think like it also speaks to what I'm saying about like social contacts that if all the libertarian people they're seeing are people who either don't take the libertarian position on immigration or uh, don't see it as important or whatever, then they're not going to see it as important, even if they come to the right conclusions. Anyway, so Dave Smith, like I've interacted with him quite a bit on Twitter and he at some point said something like, can, it was something like, can anyone point to even one thing that is an instance of a transgender person's rights being under attack. Yes. And I was like independently like having a bad day that day, like for reasons that are not Dave Smith's fault. Um, <laughs> and maybe, but it, so it, uh, but I think that like fortuitously converged into, I was like feeling like particularly like, like for, ha- for particularly open to being like actively hostile to him that day. And so I quote tweeted that and I just like gave just a litany of examples. And I also, I just mocked like how he just doesn't even seem to care about this or like the kind of like Weasley way he would try to get out of it or whatever. And I think that like this seemed to like set him off quite a bit. And then he started uh, replying to that very aggressively and we went back and forth And then someone in the Mises caucus sphere, I don't know if this is an actual Mises caucus person, but certainly in their social sphere, asked if we would do a podcast arguing the question, are trans rights under attack? And I agreed to that. And I think that went pretty well, ultimately, even though, uh, I mean, I think obviously like someone who is a professional podcaster and comedian who has had specials whatever else we want to say about it is obviously going to be better at verbal conversation than me but i think that i did pretty well in that because i had several people reaching out after that who i would even say like are not who are who are very right wing to put it lightly but said like hey like obvious you obviously were like correct in that debate and asking for more information on some of the things I was talking about. And if you go to the actual like uh, video, you'll see like a bunch of people in like the super chats who are just like dunking on me, etc. And like, that's fine to me because I think I'm not going to convince those people to begin with. But again, I'm thinking of like the marginal person. And I think it seemed like a lot of the marginal people tended to at least become more aware of the fact that there were actual laws that were happening. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I did that I felt pretty good about after doing was, so after our opening statements, I listed like a litany of, of actual laws that were either happening or uh, about to happen or whatever. 
Uh, and then Dave just kind of gave a vague, like they're pushing this on you type thing that was did not actually point to like any like government policy or anything like that, or respond to anything really that I had said. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of encouraged anyone listening to it, to the recording, to stop it and go back and try and like count the number of things that I talked about that were actual government policies the number of things Dave talked about that were actual government policies because there like weren't any in what Dave was saying. And that seemed to be very effective. I saw people who were very big Dave Smith fans literally memeing about Dave's like non-answer to that kind of question. And so I felt pretty good about that. Mm -hmm. And again, that was on that was on like a right wing MCAT podcast. It's I was the person being platformed, not mm -hmm. Dave. That's true. Uh, Dave is going to get platformed on that podcast all the time. I don't think I added anything to for Dave. Uh, I do think that I poked a hole in the wall of non conversation mm -hmm. that made people aware of the things that are like very obviously happening that if you care about the state restricting people's freedom that you would care about. Right. The one type of power that Dave Smith ostensibly cares about is state power, but laws are just, you know, our target t-shirts and it's all like them aggressing yeah. upon us, presumably. Yeah. Did you see anyone complain about you, about Dave platforming you by out of curiosity? <laughs> Or is that less? Not really. I did see people saying that they th thought that it was absurd that he was wasting his time talking right. to me yeah. or um, like this issue is so obvious that it's not worth wasting time on it or, or, and I saw people who were, this isn't really complaining to Dave about Dave, I guess, but like, so I went on, so Dave was on video and the host was on video and there was quite a lot of people watching the live stream, but I was just like my avatar, which mm -hmm. is the Wolver painting of a Wolverine in a suit. And I saw a lot of people just flabbergasted saying, I can't believe someone gets to talk to Dave Smith and they, they won't even go on camera. <laughs> and God, this, this is kind of petty, but honestly it made me like feel even better about it. Just the kind of, I don't know, but the, the how mad those people were made me a little feel a little bit better about it, which again is not the best heuristic, but it was. It is me. wild when that happens. When I um, and I, we've all blessedly forgotten Milo Yiannopoulos mostly, but when I interviewed him at the RNC, his many fans were amazed that I was, you know, given like eight minutes of of their hero was talking only to me, and they were. It's very strange when like fans of someone that you hold in contempt, you know, at best. Interesting. You've or, met Milo Yiannopoulos and kind of met, I guess, Richard Spencer, kind of? Um, yeah, I met Milo Yiannopoulos and Joe Arpaio, actual state agent evil. Um, yeah. At the RNC. That was a very strange time. I'm thinking about the ISFLC thing. Yes, that... Richard Spencer. Back when... The controversy within libertarianism was that the, the Libertarian Student uh, Students for Liberty Conference, s some rogue elements invented in, in, invited actual Nazi, actual fascist, whatever he, you know, Richard Spencer to like hold court in the hotel coffee shop. And a bunch of people, including some very nice, including some Hispanic kids were just gathered around him making disparaging noises at him and stuff. And it was like communication at the time, but some people I remember were very like, oh, you were yelling at him instead of what, like handing him a platform directly or something. But like, I, w I observed this. It was truly communication, you know? I mean, I observed it too because someone was live streaming it. And so <laughs> I was in my room watching this happen and it felt surreal anyway. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> I actually, I, yeah, God, I actually forgot about this. I even asked him, like, if I want immigrants and you don't, you know, to come to America, like, how do we decide? And he just gave a tepid, like, oh, we vote about it. I was like, okay. Yeah, so I think another another important thing on this is, like, having some kinds of conversations is just, like, showing that some of these people, like, I think this, in this, I think this applies much more to, like, 
out the out and out Nazis than the people I was just talking about, even mm-hmm. more so, is just like how baseless, how there's like <laughs> there is not actually anything deep to their views. It's just like there is just brute prejudice at the bottom, like, and then they have like graduate degrees, and so they're able to like use a lot more words before they get to that part. Um, and that was the Richard Spencer thing. Oh, he's the yeah. tie wearing, like, smart Nazi. Yeah, 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 exactly. Smart. But like at the at the bottom of like, if you ask him, like, like one, if you ask him, like who is white he doesn't really have like good answers and okay, two yeah. like if you ask him like why should i care more about being white than something else so like for example like one it's funny to bring this up because one thing that i will say for tho bishop is uh he brought up a good point against uh the richard spencers of the world once that i saw on twitter because i guess so tho is not a nazi obviously Mm -hmm. uh he's right wing bad other ways but uh he just pointed out like you notice like richard spencer will like attack like college football and because uh college football when he's at like southern universities which is one a very bad idea but two like why does he do that because like it's a sense of identity that people have that is that is very inherently multiracial and if you think of like the actual identities that people have that like drive them in their day-to-day lives it's not so like univocally racial as as that and you have to have like a reason why you are like eliminating everything else and just boiling down to that and if you press someone like the Richard Spencer of the world on that they just kind of don't really have an answer and I think it is like it is helpful for the marginal potential fascist to see like there's nothing there there mm-hmm. and there's no there there and like to give them kind of like a, a reason to step back and think do i like hold on like before they actually take that plunge right and i'm sure this will sound naive to people but i do think that that's important uh and i another thing i'll say though is i wrote an article basically saying as um as much in terms of uh it was titled like richard spencer is not a dissident intellectual or something like that but this seemed like so i also insulted some some of his like crew i guess Mm. uh and the at the time like largest alt-right podcast had an episode that was a pun off of my last name the title was, was a pun off my last name I see pun opportunities though. I'm trying to. (laughs) Anyway. And they spent like 30 to 40 minutes talking about this article that I wrote Wow. and complaining about it and started like messaging me, asking me to come on their podcast, which I was not going to do. And why not, by the way? What, I mean, what? Yeah. I was about to say is there's, there's, there's two reasons. One, and this is what I was getting to is the the simple reason is that I'm not going to go on a Nazi podcast with my real name. Yeah. Because, you know, like I, I, there's, there's situations where I would feel okay with, with that uh, myself. Like there's other like reasonable people who would think very differently about that and just see my name attached to the podcast, not right. even see the context of it, et cetera, et cetera. And if you are looking for an academic job, that is not good to have. Sure. And two, uh, in that podcast, so in the article, I had a brief thing that like explicitly uh, rejected using violence to shut down like one of the like the Richard Spencer talks or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that a lot of listeners will not like that, but that is my position, and that's something I said in passing in that article. And when they read, they read the entire article on their podcast, except for that part. Oh God. And then they said, he is basically promoting violence against us at one point in their conversation about it. And I, I, I think that was the thing. I mean, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And my thought was, I don't want to, I mean, that seems like such a clear signal that 
that i mean i mean obviously like nazis in general are not gonna argue in good faith but just like an, that's like, so obvious in, that's so such a such a clear reminder of that right and so i was like i'm definitely not going to come on if if they're signaling in advance that that's the way that they're engaging right. in that conversation and for what it's worth they that same podcast i've been told by other people that when Chris Cantwell was seeing himself as more libertarian and he went on that podcast a few times when he started trying to argue with them about something like protectionism or whatever, they literally cut off his microphone, which is extraordinary. And I think should be a lesson to anyone who thinks that they could make common cause with those people, the, any libertarian, like that it's completely expendable to them that anyway, but but yeah, so that that was the reason I didn't go on there. And I had pretty good reason to think that that wasn't going to happen on the Tho thing. And I had pretty good reason to think that that wasn't because I knew some of the people who who organized that the YouTube channel, people who did that. And I had less sure, but still pretty sure that that wasn't going to happen on the Dave Smith thing because I listened to a couple other kind of like debatey conversation-y uh, thing episodes of that guy's podcast uh, with things that it, it didn't seem like it was going in that direction. So I was comfortable doing that. I guess something that comes to mind now is how many hops until you get to an actual Nazi is also a problem just because you know, Dave Smith had a debate in kind with um, Nick Fuentes. Who- yeah is an actual fascist i would feel comfortable yeah. dubbing him as such yeah i mean there's a problem among broadly speaking you know democrat mainstream types they're painting everybody with the nazi brush and i would say you know nick fuentes is a fascist tucker carlson on his show i don't know exactly what he was but was he laundering white nationalist talking points he was is he you know a fascist nazi i don't know and, and but there comes a point when i think sort of mainstream people object to even trying to figure out the specifics of these ideologies all these people suck okay great but does it is there nothing useful in differentiating them i don't know yeah i, I mean i think it is helpful for pointing out the people who paint themselves as something other than fascist but clearly are like nick fuentes so mm-hmm. like nick fuentes will tell you that he is not a uh, white nationalist. And if if asked why he's not a white nationalist, just kind of starts talking about the PR of that word. Mm-hmm. It's not really about the ideas that he's just, he just is a white nationalist. He just is like aware that like he will go farther by like, just not using those exact words. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think it is like worth saying that. Um, I guess another thing, uh, this isn't super related, but my mind did some mental associations here. And one thing I want to say about something I was talking about earlier on the radical, the extreme anti-abortion group and just the general, the general phenomenon of elongated conversations that happen over many, a course of a long time uh, with people with very bad views and uh, even being friends with people with very evil views, evil political commitments involved in evil political projects is uh, I think most people. So I think there's, there's, there's sometimes discourse about like whether people should be friends with people with awful views or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes people will, uh, just put like a hard no, uh, and sometimes people will put a oh well, but you can change their minds through that. And um, I think there's something to the reasons for both the hard no and that you can change their minds, which is that I think you can change their minds. But the reason that most people shouldn't be friends with Fascist is obviously the key example, but I think the point extends beyond fascist, right? Uh, people of any kind of like extreme awfulness mm-hmm. is because most people aren't good at being friends, to be honest. Uh, and what I mean by that is 
that I think being a good friend with people involves not just kind of saying nice things to them or talking to them in a polite way or whatever. It also involves like taking them seriously in the sense that you like actively challenge them Mm -hmm. and you're not just kind of bracketing disagreements, but you are that because you care about that other person, you care about that other person's being so woefully mistaken and that you are able to take in whatever reasons they are giving you for their views, but also explain why those reasons are not persuasive to you. And it doesn't make sense to you why they would be persuasive to them. And I think most people are probably too high on agreeableness in a way that makes them bad friends in general, in a way that make, means that they shouldn't be friends with people of extremely awful views. And so I don't think that this is like the uh, recommendation for everyone. But I also think disagree with the hard no answer because I think people who are not so high on agreeableness and are uh, able to actually challenge people there in friendly interactions with, that is seems to be at the very least something that seems to be the most effective thing in terms of people actually breaking free of those kinds of uh, walled off, walled off uh, epistemically closed environments. And to be clear, that's also not say anything negative about like broad social condemnation of those people. Sure. I think those two things work in tandem. So a big story the last few years was uh, Derek Black, who was the son of Don Black, who's the guy who created Stormfront. Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Derek Black is now, as far as I can tell, solidly not a Nazi, actively involved in anti-racist stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But Do- Derek Black uh, I think I said Derek Black, but I just want to be clear. Derek Black, not Don Black, is the ex-Nazi. Don Black's still a Nazi. Um, anyway, Derek Black was actively involved in in that movement. He did podcasts himself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I know. I've read about him in the past. Yeah. he And then when he was in college, long story short, uh, people discovered who he was after like a semester and a half or something like that. He was at like a small liberal arts college. And so word got around very quickly. And he had like overwhelming social condemnation, but a group of students, um, I think mostly Jewish, I want to say, like just invited him to like come to like their social gatherings. And over time, uh, he like just stopped being a Nazi. And he himself will say. Interesting that he said yes to the invitation. I almost. Well, I think the reason is because he had like no other social contacts. Yeah, yeah. part, I think. I think that's a big part of it. And, and that's what I'm about to say is like he himself will say like that sometimes people will use that story to say, oh, well, everyone should just be as friendly as possible. Right. Yeah. And he says, but no, like in his case, like it was the overwhelming social condemnation and the people who were friends with him kind of working in tandem mm-hmm. uh, that like the so- social condemnation kind of like makes it salient to him uh, like something that's like a shock to the system of a reason to like be thinking so actively about his beliefs and how much they are rejected and then at the same time having a friend group who is not just other nazis Mm -hmm. um, makes it psychologically possible to break from it and so I, I, I part of me wants to say I just think people should moralize this a lot less but that's not even really right because I think people should moralize it quite a bit they should just recognize there's like a lot of nuance and context if you are the kind of person if you're the kind of very weird personality i'm describing who is not in danger yourself of falling in a uh into the the bad views or uh someone who you have to know yourself though yeah someone who (laughs) knows that you're actually going to challenge them then you like you have a good reason to uh, do that if you if you are so inclined. And I think it's bad for people to just condemn those people across the board. Um, but also like if you know your, you know yourself and you know that you're not that person, you also are doing something right by just like shunning people. I think both of those things have have their role. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense both practically and just based on people's skills that they would take different avenues on this. I just, um, I wonder also, 
I don't know about you, but I am a white girl. And though my last name is German, so Nazis, you know, probably think there's hope for me with my fine German background. Though several times when I wrote something bad about Nazis, they found me on Twitter and called me Jewish. And that's always weird because I'm like, I don't want to say I'm not because you're Nazis. Yeah. But the point is, um, I guess, when, you know, when talking about this with leftist types, often it sort of comes back to who's more under threat by these belief systems, you know? And, you know, if, if I, um, in, in a Nazi taking over country, hopefully I, um, you know, get executed because I'm not a Nazi and I don't fall into line. That'd be nice. But my background is, you know, I'm safe. I'm nice and pasty white. So like, I don't know, like, is it, is it, is it people's job? Like you talked to Dave Smith about trans people being oppressed, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is not a personal oppression that, that you have suffered under. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I imagine some people object to that because it's not, you know, it's not your personal thing. Who are you to speak about it? Or is it your job to be like, make it so the people who it's more personal for don't necessarily have to, to, to go through that effort. I mean, we all have to choose how far we're going to go, I guess, but like, I don't know. It just, all of this is more interesting than simply no platforming, but yeah, I agree. <laughs> It's 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 more interesting than just sim the simple flat no platform that just kind of reduces to no interaction, and mm -hmm. it's also more interesting than just like the naive like everyone talk to everyone <laughs> about everything in every. And contact. surely there are no morals or like lines or principles that you know like yeah, everyone and, just talk and that everyone is in a good position to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah, and so. And I think another difficulty on this, so so I think all the stuff you were just talking about, I can see good arguments in both directions. For me, uh, it just comes down to the question of there's something <laughs> that I want th this particular social sphere to hear mm -hmm. that then too, I don't think they're going to hear other than that, other than me saying it. And three... Like I have an opportunity to say it and I am reasonably confident in myself that I am able to say it meaningfully. And that's just what compels me, I guess. And part of that, I mean, like, so like these people, they'll argue with other people. And I think sometimes uh, people just kind of like shut down and are not even like arguing with them anymore. They're just kind of, expressing reactive attitudes um, mm -hmm. that are fitting, but nonetheless to the marginal potential person come across as, well, this person doesn't know what to say here. And I felt reasonably confident that uh, even when I would be expressing reactive attitudes that I would still be making points. And I think that just knowing that it is possible for someone to have th things to say on something I think is, is even something, but yeah, I mean, I think there another difficulty on this is like, since part of this is knowing yourself, obviously there's a lot of self deception on all of this. Mm -hmm. And I think just the worry about self deception about like how useful my contribution would be is something that I worry about quite a bit. Um, I was pretty worried about it to be honest with you immediately after the Dave Smith thing. But then, uh, I had, I had those people reaching out to me that I mentioned. I saw people who are otherwise in the more the Dave Smith theor sphere of things, literally memeing about him evading some points. Did Dave think he knew? Because I feel like I know him via Twitter enough to know that he hasn't looked up specific laws against trans people because he doesn't care. And because in his mind, the attitude is they're pushing this on society. And I don't care for that as a social conservative. Here's what I think he thought is that the only things in question were things that he had some bullshit reason why, well, that's not really a rights violation. <laughs> like stuff about like, Oh, well, that's a difficult question. What children's rights involve and all that. Yes. But for different reasons than, than that. <laughs> 
<laughs> and like, oh, well, some of these bathroom things, that's about public property. And how do we deal with public property? Da, 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 da. And hold your breath until it's a privatized paradise. And until then. And he. And so there's problems with that. But I think he there's like problems with even just his like what he's trying to do on those, obviously. But I think he just like wasn't even aware of uh, the things extending out to adults uh, mm-hmm. to some extent. Do you think you changed him in any way or, or not? Um, maybe like just being vaguely aware of some of the bills that I was talking about, mm-hmm. but that's about all I can think of. In my um, neighborhood, there was going to be a debate at uh, the University of Pittsburgh between absolute cretin Michael Knowles of the eradicate transgenderism um, yeah. school of thought and it was actually going to be Georgia McCloskey, the fabulous 80-year-old libertarian economist, trans woman. And that ended up not happening. And I don't, there was, you know, a great local activist outcry. And they were going to do, you know, the Antifa spirit of whatever they were going to do. And a young conservative libertarian uh, gay guy that I know ended up taking uh, Deirdre McCloskey's spot. And I'm sure he, you know, trounced knolls and stuff but i don't know i was a little i kind of wanted to see that original you know it would have been a smackdown i'm quite sure of it but like i don't know if it would have done any good for the world or not because she is an intellectual and he literally is so blessedly distant from even pretending to be a libertarian that he believes that you know men can't wear women's clothing in public. Like that's somehow, like, yeah. it, it's, it's reasonable to, to flatly outlaw that. I don't know if yeah. that means that I, as a cis woman, cannot wear pants. Like we would have to, you know, Knowles and I would have to, to hash that out. But I don't know if that, like talking to someone like that is more absurd than talking to someone who's sort of more faux intellectual, like God forbid, even Matt Walsh has at least gone through more motions pretending that he's, you know, a deep thinker. I think on those kinds of things, it is it is more difficult when there's less common ground to begin with. Mm-hmm. But sometimes it can even be useful just to like, like trying to get to the basis of those of the differences that mean that there's no common ground. Like, why assume that like this is within like the purview of state power to do this? Because Knowles is a yeah. I mean, a charlatan, I guess, but yeah. And I, I guess actually, and then think about it. So like I, since you brought up Walsh, like I don't really have much to say on this other than just like, I think one danger is, so I actually watched that documentary thing really? that Walsh did. Mm-hmm. And something that he gets a lot of rhetorical mileage out of is that his answer to the question, uh, what is a woman is mm-hmm. like, so like straightforward and simple and seemingly straightforward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he can just say it in like a sentence. Mm -hmm. Whereas for someone uh, who is not anti-trans, it is a much more difficult question. Mm -hmm. And that means that either people uh, give off the cuff answers that are ill considered and Mm -hmm. have obvious like, or academic jargon and it's easily mockable either they like have like obvious immediate problems because they haven't like they don't have an have a, like a concrete answer to the question or two because it, it there's like one part where there's a guy who's talking answering the question and he's taking a very long time to answer the question and walsh effectively edits it so that it just shows the passing of time while he is giving the answer. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but it's interesting because it's like, so it's obvious why that will seem to someone like this, the single sentence answer is so, is so much more plausible because it's so much simpler, but why think that it has to be that simple? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's part of the great gotcha that, that the right is now using with that very question. I mean, it's exactly. if you can't answer it, I mean, that's, we're done. Yeah, like, yeah. I, have, I have one. And so I think I, I, I don't really have like a great solution to this, but I think this is like a danger of like things that are so simple 
even though they're like obviously wrong. And I guess the only thing I know to think of is to think of of similar cases where like there is an apparent a possible obvious answer, a, a, a possible simple answer that is also obviously wrong. Mm-hmm. And then like compare that to what the correct answer is and how much either unclear or a long that's going to end up being. So like what I said, the Dave Smith conversation is I brought this up and I said, it would be like, so you ask someone like, what should we do for like a serious pandemic? Mm-hmm. Uh, and someone who is like a normie, uh, can just say like, oh, well, you basically more or less do like what we did during COVID, right? This have the government do more or less what it did during COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's like a really obvious, like obvious, straightforward, simple answer. But of course, there's all sorts of reasons why that's not the right answer. Ineffectual yet authoritarian. That's my motto. Yeah, exactly. So like, what is the right answer? Like, One, very unclear in all its details. Two, whatever it is would take a very long time to a point where you would be able to edit whatever I was saying Mm -hmm. to show the passing of time and make it seem like like I'm just talking in circles or whatever. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong, especially if we're clear on why the simple answer was wrong, right? I mean, if you're you're being intellectually honest and actually thinking about it and... Yeah. That puts you at a disadvantage among large swaths of the right. Maybe not all of them, but, you know. Yeah. I Sometimes I worry that, like, libertarianism, anarchism, etc. is at a disadvantage in general because, like, the libertarian or anarchist answer on things are so uh, far away from current way of of approaching these problems that there's going to be a simple answer that everyone is familiar with that is flatly incompatible with libertarianism or anarchism and whatever the correct answer is is going to be like very complicated and anything that you try to say that is simple uh will have obvious problems that a that a reasonable person who does not already agree with you can see the answer of and so like that's kind of why it seems to me like it seems like there is a bigger divergence among like libertarians than anyone else in terms of like trying to way to put this delicately like people they're both like extremely stupid libertarians and extremely intelligent libertarians and there seems to be like more of that phenomenon with libertarians than like almost anything else i think it's because of this having to like give answers to things where either you can give a really simple and stupid answer that will be obviously stupid to, to other people, or it's just going to, or it's going to require like some really elongated thing that is right, but is takes a lot of effort to see, I guess. Or, I mean, localized knowledge, localized action. None of, I mean, nothing sounds good in a policy paper. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was going to move towards some some less open end questions, but first, perhaps this is too big a question, but what is it about left wing radicalism that is so much more about no platforming and sort of this type of, you know, the the great Antifa question and the great Antifa meme thing where it's always like photos from D Day and ha huh, that was Antifa. But that sort of tolerance, you know, 90s ACLU thing, it's more out of fashion all the time, it seems like. And I don't know if there's something about the left or anarchists that makes that more likely to happen. So I have very complicated thoughts on Antifa itself, uh, in part because, like, one, like, that term is used so especially post 2015 has been used in so many different ways. Sure. But like in terms of like core actual Antifa groups, they do both some things that I think are good Mm -hmm. and important, like identifying and uh, keeping tabs on fascist groups, et cetera. And then also the thing that everyone knows about, Mm -hmm. uh, which is, so then, and it also like various kinds of like violent, like self defense in ways that I think are um, perfectly NAP compliant, I mm-hmm. guess. Uh, but 
And then, but also the violent disruption of fascist speech, assembly, etc. And I think something that has driven a lot of that is that a lot of the mainstream critics of that stuff clearly either are like saying things that are like clearly inadequate responses. So one, uh, what I was talking earlier about the people taking the lesson from the Derek Black thing is we should just be friendly to everyone, right? right? Similarly, like Daryl Davis, who is a uh, black man, musician who has successfully deconverted like a shit ton of neo-Nazis and clan oh, sure. people by through friendship and seems to bond with them over music, interestingly, <laughs> a lot of the times, and then, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Which is not something you could ever ask someone to do. Like, yeah. that, that is obviously something he has to have <laughs> taken yeah. the initiative to do. Exactly. And obviously, like, if you watch a documentary about him, you can tell that he is a very particular kind of person mm -hmm. who is, like, able to be successful at this. And But people take from Daryl Davis, they take from the Derek Black story, like, oh, well, everyone should just be friendly to everyone and then that'll solve it, which is obviously not right. Or uh, sometimes people will, so I'm looking for, uh, just downplay the extent of, of the fascist threat, mm -hmm. right? Or have hyperbolic statements about comparing the, comparing like the aggressive violence that, that the Antifa groups are involved in with the fascists, like treating them as if they're like cl right. even close to equivalent. Right. right. And I think all of those things, I think all of those things contribute to why the, uh, for lack of a better term, like Antifa type position was getting so popular because a lot of the critics of it were saying obviously stupid things. I mean, it was the ultimate normie position to be like, let's just, to have open dialogue, even in a way that's good, but they would say it in a sort of naive fashion, I feel like. Yeah. And that became yeah, exactly. And, and And I think also another thing is, is I'm frustrated by the term no platform because it like, it encompasses so many different things. Sure, yeah. Which, so like no platform can mean literally not like bringing on Richard Spencer onto your on your podcast to have a friendly conversation <laughs> where you're not pushing anything back. We right? will not do that here on non Serbian. Right. Or it could mean like don't interact with him at all, or it could mean actual physical violence to disrupt something, or it could mean like persuading someone else to not platform him, which is not you not platforming him, but is but it is not violent, but is another kind of thing. And all of these things are very different questions. And if you just throw it under the banner of, of no platform for or against, then it's kind of like treating them as package deals. Right. So that's a frustration I have with that. It's very similar to the frustrations that I have with things like cancel culture, right. Sure, Which obviously yeah. refers to so many different things which I have very different opinions about and will apply very differently in very different cases. There's even the things that I am, that I have those very different opinions about. And so, and then when you get down to cancel culture for or against, it's like, you're not going to have a productive conversation about that. And in the same way, no platform for or against, I think you're not really going to have a productive conversation about. Well, there are a million more things I could keep asking you, but Another thing is, and if you don't have this off the cuff, that's all right, but if you could make sort of two disparate, like, like first of all, the, you know, the reactionary paleo types, and then say the no platforming social anarchist types, if you could make them read a book that they would broadly understand, do you have one um, that you would suggest in each of those cases? Oh, man. Oh man, I don't know. Um, I haven't thought about so because I, I guess like the things that I would be concerned about in those cases are so different. Because um, mm -hmm. my first impulse is to, I'll just say what my first impulse is, and then say like why this is almost certainly not what you're asking. 
uh, which is something like uh, uh, Markets Not Capitalism and the early 70s Libertarian Forum stuff okay. with like Murray Rothbard and Carl Hess for mm-hmm. the uh, more right wing and caps because I think that gets you in a broadly left libertarian direction. Uh, and then for uh, the social anarchists, I would say also markets not capitalism, but maybe also like with great hesitation, use of knowledge in society, just kind of familiarizing themselves with like the basic economic knowledge problem. Mm -hmm. And both of those things though are kind of in an economic direction. And I don't think that's really what you were asking. I took you to be worried about like the kind of like cultural stuff with the paleos and the free speech stuff with the social anarchist side of things. And if that's the case, I don't really don't know. I, so I think, I don't know what the one thing I would recommend to people Oh man, both of those things. I'm not sure I know a really good answer for like, like the one thing that would kind of like incline someone in a less right wing direction culturally. Mm -hmm. And then also, I don't know that I've feel like there is any one kind of like case for free speech that I am like totally happy with. Okay. I think the strongest kinds of cases are the kind of million ones where it's kind of a social epistemology thing where you're not going to be uh, where, where there's something important about like the free flow of information. Mm -hmm. But the last time I reread on Liberty, like I felt like something was missing. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the great defense of free speech is still to be written. Well, maybe you, you can work, you can crack that. Maybe, maybe one day. I mean, I can think of two Supreme Court cases that do back up the fact that the people at the fringes have helped the rest of us, because the flag burning case, Texas v. something, was one of the Revolutionary Communist Party weirdos who are terrible. Um, uh huh. And there are several. You don't have to stand for the pledge, you know, even if your school ch- uh, child things that the Jehovah's Witnesses are responsible for. And that's also a fringy group. So, I mean, like, you can find an actual concrete example of this weirdo, you know, actually bestowed upon the normal folk some kind of rights. So, yeah. So, another thing. Okay, so I'm looking for it and I'm having trouble finding it. But. There was a really good short article at uh, Liberal Currents mm-hmm. a long time, a while, a long, uh, like within the last, like three years ago, I think, by, I want to say Adam Gurry, mm-hmm. called like, can we, af- something like, can we afford free speech in a pandemic? I'm having trouble finding it right now. But he just like went down and like listed a bunch of things that it would have made sense to censor if you had a broadly like censorship for public health reasons sure. stuff that ended up either being right or was like important uh, that the information was available or something like that. And that's a different, very different kind of question from the question of the stuff, the stuff that we would have in mind with no platform usually at least with fascists and all that but and i with that i would definitely push in the direction you were saying of just the like kind of skepticism of state Mm -hmm. power in general that like this is going to be used in not the direction you want it to be used we know it similar problem with like the the neoliberal group that Mm -hmm. it's not going to go in uh the direction of defeating the reactionaries and it's also just as it's not going to go in the direction of whatever the the best papers at the best econ journal say it's going to go in the direction of entrenching power mm-hmm. and serving the interests of the powerful um and uh stuff like i think you um i apologize if you just said this because i was looking for the adam gurry thing but i heard you talking about court cases mm-hmm. but the the famous um 
the famous uh, like uh, thing about like not uh, saying fire in a crowded theater. Oh yeah, no, I didn't say that, that one. But yeah, from, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. It comes from exactly the kind of like speech repression that I think the people making these points would not want. So right, that sound that that one's so weird, and people still fall prey to it because it sounds like I mean disorderly conduct is also really bullshit, but like literally. If you yell fire in a crowd theater, you'll be cited for something, and it may well make sense. <laughs> but that was literally about the draft, you know? Yeah. Advocating against the draft. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, another thing is, like, um, so the actual, like, in, like, specific, like, non, like, strict sense of the term, like, Antifa group people tend to not be hate speech law people. Right. But nonetheless... It is worth noting that, like, the hate speech law literature, at the very least, it is not at all a a clear conclusion that it actually deters hate speech and actually decreases the extent of hate speech. It is, at the very least, not a settled question. It seems to tilt against that answer. Mm -hmm. And when people make the arguments for it, they tend to argue again for hate speech laws on other grounds because that deterrence argument is so unsettled. And of course, like physical disruption in a decentralized way is not the same thing as a law. There might be reasons that that might be effective and the laws wouldn't be effective, but I think it should at least give pause because, so this is not a reading recommendation, but it is a thought that I have, which is um, if you're thinking again in terms of the marginal potential fascist mm -hmm. and you see a world that is like erupted in chaos of people speaking and, and then getting shut down, you are more likely to panic and go in a fascist direction. Now, does that mean that like this is going to affect the people who are already fascist? No, they're already fascist. Does this mean that it's going to turn like very not fascist people into fascist magically? No. But it does make make the fascist message a little bit more plausible mm -hmm. to that particular person. And I think in all of these questions, that's what you have to have in mind. And and so it's not just, oh, well, we don't know that this would work. I think also that there are real risks of it being actively counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just get there's a lot of uh, paradox of tolerance is like self-evidently. Well, and that's why. No civil rights for Nazis. Actually, actually, hold on. I'll just say, so on a reading recommendation on that, mm -hmm. there was a uh, mutual exchange at C4SS on the topic of uh, no platform and anti-fascist action stuff and that had uh, William Gillis, uh, Jason Lee Bias, and several other people in it and... I think some of the arguments in that on the more Antifa critical mm -hmm. side of things were very good. And I would recommend reading the whole thing, but uh, in terms of something that would, that would be in, it'll be a reading recommendation. I might say that uh, a lot of the points there are similar to the ones that I'm making here. So one article in particular to look for might be, Holding Our Ground, a Critique of the Ethics and Strategy of Violence Against Fascist Assembly. Uh, and then related to that, also beyond the whack-a-mole of no platform. So I have looked at those myself, so I can definitely vouch for there's all this good stuff over there. But before that, you have to do the cappuccino question, which I remember 80% of the time. And that is, of course, how would I get a cappuccino? in your political utopia, Charles? I think the options for that are endless. It is basically all the ways you could imagine one getting made and getting to you. I think you could go to a coffee shop and buy one. You could, you, you could make one. You could get one of your friends to make one for you. All the ways you can do it right now, uh, you could do it then. I, after this conversation, am going to go to a coffee shop that happens to be a worker cooperative. So that might be the go. paradigmatic case uh, of that. 
Utopia and that's now. Happening already in the real world. I like it. Very good. Is there anything you're working on slash you want to plug? And also where can the good people find you on the internet? Um, well, they can find me at uh, Twitter at worst underscore account. And um, the very worst. Yes. And I am also on Blue Sky as worst account and I don't haven't used blue sky very much, but who knows what's happening with these things. Um, I'm intending, I keep meaning to start doing like YouTube video essays or, um, uh, like podcast type stuff under this, under this name. Um, but it keeps not happening. I recorded one with a friend, but we haven't even really late listened to that. So I don't know if that'll happen, but if it does happen, I will certainly talk about it on Twitter. So I think that's the thing to do. Um, but if I do do this podcast, which again, this might be the most that is ever said about it. Uh, it would just be me and a friend of mine, uh, just kind of like lazily talking about whatever happens to interest us, whether that's, uh, politics or movie we just saw, or I think we're talking about uh, doing an episode on the video game Soma mm -hmm. and related philosophical literature um, by people like Derek Parfit and Christine Korsgaard on personal identity. So that's a possible thing we might do, but so that's, a, that's the thing I might do. So I, I can't even guarantee that that's going to happen, but it's very enigmatic, Charles. <laughs> It's an enigmatic plug for something that may or may not exist one day. Yeah. Well, Charles, this was very good talk, and I thank you for coming on Non-Servium today. As usual, people can follow Non-Servium on all sorts of platforms, including Blue Sky now, um, and Mastodon and other things you've never heard of. But for now, Twitter is Non-Servium Media, all one word. Um, I'm still there for some reason. Lucy Stag, L U C Y S T A G. Um, we'll be back again someday. And thank you again, Charles. Thank you. listening to the non-servium podcast if you enjoyed this episode why not subscribe over on our youtube channel or on your favorite podcast platform you can also follow us across social media on twitter facebook instagram and mastodon if you're extra interested in seeing this project continue consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com but if you can't contribute financially we still like you a whole lot and you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy as always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much. <laughs>